Chapter 11, Services Marketing. Welcome to the discussion around the concepts of customer satisfaction and why satisfied customers are useful. Now, this is one of those areas where you'd think it was a straightforward thing of a satisfied customer is a, an obvious end game, a no-brainer, so to speak. But the challenge is that as we know from the subduction model, customers and other customers don't always line up, they don't always match up, and there's always that point in time where you are facing yourself having to prioritize which customer is the most important for you to deal with. So a couple of key things is the textbook and the textbook slide deck talks about projection. There's this idea that's been floating around for ages of you know, for every complaint received, for one complaint, there are 26 customers who have the same problem. Uh huh. The average person with the problem tells nine or ten people, some will tell more than 20, customers will complain. And this uh, gives a lot of credence to the idea of uh, the customer is always right, you always have to satisfy the customer, except these are projections. These are elements where people have made a study, projected from that study a few years ago, a while back, and not necessarily followed it up, replicated it, or otherwise held it to um, a bunch of standards. That's not to say that you shouldn't be aware of sometimes the customer isn't going to come to you with feedback they're going to go to someone else but at the same time we also have to be very careful not to go and fall into the squeaky wheel a loud shouty unrepresentative voice from and if we think back to our stakeholder theory loud complaining customer claiming to represent the unvoiced majority is quite likely to be a stakeholder that where you feel that there's urgency but you have to question legitimacy and power now customer satisfaction dissatisfaction we have talked about the expectancy disconfirmation model across a range of chapters and it just boils down to confirmation is what i expected equals what i perceived disconfirmation in the negative sense is I expected more and I perceived less. Positive disconfirmation is I expected less and I perceived more. So it, it was what I was expecting. It wasn't what I, I was expecting and I was pleasantly surprised. It wasn't as good as I was expecting and I was unpleasantly disappointed. Now, again, uh, one of the things in marketing, periodically we talk about things that seem like they're, they're sort of no brainer. But we have to raise them and mention them because they are important to be factors that you have to discuss. Customer satisfaction is beneficial, therefore it's worth pursuing. Positive word of mouth is an outcome that is worth engaging in because positive word of mouth from a genuine customer is still more powerful than paid content whether that's paid content from a person pretending to be a satisfied customer or paid content that's openly an advert. A couple of the other facets in here is that when we start looking at this from the perspective of a satisfied customer will buy more from the company. So you are now looking at uh, the end of matrix uh, growth model, the opportunity to sell more to existing customers. Satisfied customers are less likely to be lost to competitors, so satisfaction begets loyalty. Loyalty is a barrier to shifting to switching. Customer satisfaction also uh, means that the customer is getting value from the price they're paying at the moment. They are less likely then to be priced shifting. If they are satisfied, then a change in price is not necessarily an imperative to change provider. And 
Also, customer satisfaction tends to lead to happier staff. Happier staff tend to lead to happier customers. It's a good positive feedback loop. Now, the reputation, the positive feedback, uh, one of the things I just want to point to, every time you come across a list like this, it's worth seeing if it has been, if it's recurrent, if it's shifted, if it was a rank ordering of its time. But a couple of things I want to talk to here in terms of uh, reputation. Innovativeness as a key innovation is not always a positive thing for the customers. If the customer is satisfied and then you promptly change everything about the cut about the product because you're being innovative and you're innovating, that's not helping. So some of these things are listed, but that's not actually uh, a contributing factor. Now, a couple of other things. I want to mention the customer satisfaction surveys. Be careful with these. They need to be done well and they need to be valuable in terms of the customers should feel that they are getting value for contributing. Particularly if you are locking employee performance to customer satisfaction surveys, and if you're using something as dumb as the net promoter score, where 10 means okay, nine means you suboptimal, and eight below means fire this person, you're not going to get useful data. Net promoter scores and the five star rankings and all these things that are now known to be employee manu or ways to manufacture reasons to get rid of employees are not providing you with useful feedback anymore. If you know that no matter how bad the service was, if you give this person less than four out of five, you will cost them their job you're probably not going to want to cost them the job, but also you're putting your employees at risk of malicious complaint, of staff being bullied, staff being exploited, staff being threatened, of you will give me extras, benefits and bonuses beyond what is re reasonable, or I will give you three out of five. So your feedback forms have to be valuable. They have to capture something that is useful. And you've got to treat them like a proper market research project. There has to be a point and purpose to this and it has to feed, the loop has to close. You have to feed it back into the organization. Now, customer satisfaction, again, um, the direct measures have to have a point and a purpose there has to be a benchmark. Uh, this is why SurfCall uses pre-test, post-test. This is why you need, with an ongoing organization, you need to have internal metrics so you can get a valuable, useful score to see is the quality improving? Uh, is satisfaction increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it declining? Is it seasonally adjusted? Do we have to make adjustments for some areas that the customers are harsher in their feedback than others? You need to actually have larger data sets than a single one shot five point or 10 point survey. So here's the thing, customer satisfaction ratings, the basis of something like the net promoter score is the assumption that everything is the customer feedback back to you being as it's going to be in the 80-90% positive range means that only those three numbers 8, 9 and 10 mean anything on the survey. Doesn't help. Well, if you've got this you need to be also considering the idea that okay maybe most customers and self-reported satisfaction is the fact that customers are satisfied that for the vast majority of transactions, people are satisfied with, yeah, it's a co-created experience or it's a co-produced experience or this product does what you wanted. 
that failure is actually an unusual event rather than a standardized event. Also, any service that has a 50-50 uh, would be uh, a problem. A couple of things uh, in terms of the you know, factors influencing customer satisfaction ratings, people being satisfied, cross the trees, uh, the methods of data collection, if you give an anonymous feedback system and power to that anonymous feedback system, there will be people who will find personal pleasure in exploiting it, and that's their consumer behavior side kicking in. They see a value in exerting power in an environment where there is no consequence to them. We know this, so anonymous surveys are becoming increasingly less valuable because they are themselves not a useful measure of what we're trying to address. Also, your question form, if you ask someone to think, what were the problems that you had? They will politely try and help you. If you say, how good was that service? They will give you a scale of, well, it was this good to that good. If you say, oh, how, was there anything that went wrong today? To be polite, you're going to have to answer yes and think of something that didn't work. So you want to be watching for social bias and the structuring of your questions and therefore setting up something where people are not, or well, you're trying to not cue them. You're trying to not prime them in a particular direction. You're looking for uh, questions like, how was the experience rather than was the experience negative, was the experience positive? So your timing, uh, so social desirability bias has come up a couple of times. Uh, one of the challenges obviously is that the nature of the service is going to determine the extent to which post facto, post production, uh, the customer's ability to work out whether they had a good service. And if we focus on the three character traits, the search-based attributes at the time of service and immediately after service, probably the best time to ask, were you satisfied? If you're looking at experience-based, at or during the service would be the time to ask. If you're looking at credence-based, it doesn't matter when you ask. They're not going to know if it was a good service or not, so it's going to be difficult to measure, so your timing has to be considered Particularly around one of the big challenges is when you have a service that will take time to vest. For example, if you go to a doctor, uh, the doctor gives you a diagnosis and then gives you a treatment plan and we ask you immediately, you walk out of the room, are you satisfied with your treatment plan? It's like, yes, I'm satisfied that I've received a plan. 18 months later, having followed that plan and recovered fully, you are, your satisfaction can be quite different. But also this is where we run into problems of 12 months into the plan of, you've been given a treatment plan of heavy physiotherapy, physical activity, you've been in pain most days out of, you know, nine days out of 10 it's been pain, because you haven't recovered yet, if we ask you then, you go, this plant's rubbish. I'm in pain all the time. Six months later, when the treatment has taken effect and the pain's worn off and the recovery process has successfully brought you back to 100%, you're going to be much more uh, inclined to say, this was a good treatment plan. Because it's a credence product and you don't know during the experience whether it's going right or not, you have to, if we ask you during the experience, it's going to give us a biased answer or an answer that's incomplete. Now, the thing about a customer satisfaction survey is they are not in and of themselves the only thing. If you're going to run satisfaction surveys, you have to benchmark them. There has to be a pattern. You are using it to determine trends in the data, not snapshots. If you High customer satisfaction to feedback, focus group, 
sales patterns and boundary spanning staff information, then you will see a useful thing because you've got to, like any data source, customer satisfaction surveys are best when they're triangulated. So a lot of your skills for market research, you're studying market research as in terms of its technique, in terms of the validation of surveys and scale items, the role and use of data, really important when you're trying to do customer satisfaction. So some of the uh, other, some of the stated criticisms of customer satisfaction, I've mentioned a few on the way through. One of uh, the aspects here is that if you think about it from the point of view of current needs, are the current needs being met? Customer satisfaction is not designed in many aspects to think about future needs. You're, think, you're asking, were you satisfied with, with the product that you've experienced? You're not always going to be thinking in terms of, were you satisfied <coughs> with the potential product you might need to experience in the future if your circumstances change? Uh, a couple of the other things on that aspect, though, is... The focus on the current experience, the current service versus the future needs, you may also find that it focuses on the experience as it is without questioning how skilled is the employee, the customer in co-creating or where does the employee customer co-creation, where's the balance of power and implementation lie. Uh, like I said before, I believe that if you're going to do customer satisfaction, it's got to be triangulated. Firms, employees, and the boundary spanners need to be party to it. If you have a complaint of, I used your service and the staff didn't help me, and then you, so obviously you're going to be looking at the, the staffing, there'll be staff issues, etc. If you cross-reference that and find out that the staff were frequently rebuffed and told that they they weren't required and weren't needed, uh, and then the customer complained that the staff didn't help, there's a mismatch in the service design or there's a mismatch in the function here. So you've got to have you've got to be looking at as a co-created process all parties to the process, and also uh, look the bottom dot point is called production orientation. Uh, it's not always a good idea, but it's not always the wrong idea. There are certain points in time, particularly around uh, health and well-being, medicine, and certainly education and a few other services, where the customer really doesn't know what they want. Or rather, they want an outcome, but the process they're suggesting isn't going to work for them. The outcome, I want my children to be really healthy. The process that isn't working for them, failing to use any form of peer-reviewed medical science. The customer is going to complain if the children aren't healthy at the end of the treatment period, but if the customer hasn't been willing to provide their side of the party or engage the right products or follow the service scripts, it's really difficult to be able to say, oh, look, at you know, customers dissatisfied because of our side. Sometimes also customers are the wrong fit for the organization. So a couple of things are the customer expectations. All service, uh, if we just use the service gap framework as the fundamental, we use the expectation confirmation. You need to know what the customer expects. And we break that down into the three categories of what do they think will happen? What do they want to happen? And what's a midpoint between the two? The closer the gap between desired service, adequate service, and predicted service, then the more standardized, the more predictable, the more routine the service is, probably easier for the service provider. So this is the idea. The, uh, Elements here, the expected versus adequate, the predicted and the perceived. What you are fundamentally trying to do here is operate an area we refer to as the zone of tolerance. And I'll come up a little bit later. What the customer perceives versus what they expect. 
You go into a movie, it will take movies as a great example. You go to see a new movie. If you've poured over every trailer that's going, you've seen all the behind the scenes footage, you have bought pre-bought all the merchandise and you pre-ordered the DVD before the cinema release, your expectations are going to be much higher than somebody who's just happened to pop into the cinema. Now, the film itself, objectively, is going to be the same experience for both of you, uh, but your prediction as to what and your desire will be slightly different, largely different. The thing that we're looking for as services marketers, if we're going for standardization, we want to really understand what is adequate service and how well adequate surface can hold its standing. Because one of the challenges in expectation confirmation is if you delight the customer and you exceed adequacy, you exceed uh, baseline, or you exceed desired, that will move up the next set of expectations. So there's a little feedback loop in here of Adequate service will, predicted service will determine what adequate service looks like. But your challenge here is that if you go too far to the desired or above desired in the expected, it's going to have to move predicted. And the zone of tolerance. So, adequate is the minimum level. What's the bottom line? Desired. What's the level, the top line level? Anything between the two hits the zone of tolerance. What you're trying to avoid is going too far above or below the zone of tolerance. And it's really important to factor in the idea that going well below the zone of tolerance will recover, require service recovery. But going above the zone of tolerance will cause perception creep, will cause adequacy creep. So you've got particularly if you're looking for consistency, you're really keen to have consistency as a feature to your service, you have to stay within the zone. You have to avoid exceeding in a positive manner, With otherwise you are going to keep having to one-up and best the previous service. So in terms of uh, breaking out the expectations of service, there are a lot of factors in play here. And if you're feeling, hey, this looks like the service scape for inside people's minds, there's a reason for that. One of the things I just want to draw your attention to on adequate service is the transitory service intensifiers and the situational factors. So this is drawing on consumer behavior. Uh, this is drawing on frameworks you've studied before because situational context, you go to a service and so you're off to get your morning coffee, it's a routine, you've been doing it day in, day out for the duration of the semester and one morning the weather is diabolical, sky has fallen, there is ice, there is threat of snow, there is rain and the coffee shop queue that you don't mind normally being in because it sort of wanders through nice warm areas or snakes around through the sunlight is currently ankle deep in water. You're not, there's nothing the coffee shop could do about it because the bad weather has caused a situational factor of you don't want to queue for that product. You don't want there to be a queuing experience this morning. But if we go up a couple of other steps here is we look at things like the transitory service intensifiers of what is adequate, what will satisfy in the event of I just need something, let's get it done. So your context, your times of purchases, those factors are going to determine your low end. Uh, at your upper end, your desires, there's a certain level of personality and personal trait that will be involved here. There's also the enduring uh, service intensifiers, the personal service philosophy. Like It's always worth reading the stuff up in depth because 
The personal service philosophy will influence you as a consumer, understanding this about yourself. To what extent do you want to be waited on? To what extent do you think, oh, I should co-produce this? On the other side, you have, uh, again, this is where the GAPS model will uh, operationalize these elements, is you have the explicit service promise. What did the company say they were going to do? What's in writing? What have they promised? What have they implied? Uh, on the implicit service elements, what is the message the service scape is giving? What is the implied quality based on the price tag? What's the word of mouth? What's the word on the street? Now, word of mouth can be an absolute disaster for service providers because if you go to somewhere where someone's had an absolute delight, well above expected desired service, and they have talked it up, suddenly that's the bench line. That's the benchmark. That's the baseline you're expecting of this amazing service because you've heard from so many other people, it's an amazing service, that's gonna push your desired service. You're also going to have, and the final thing here is your past experience with the service modifies your zone of tolerance. And that's a really important facet that you've got to deal with. Once the customer has experienced the service, they know more about it, they know their role, they know how it fits with what they uh, are looking for, they also, the self-perceived service role, a more veteran uh, service employee and a more experienced service customer will know their respective roles and the adequacy, the bottom line for what is required. If it's a very strongly co-produced role, the customer can come in, get started and get underway with the service delivery before the employee has come in and needed to help. So much more co-production can be on the, oh look, I had to do most of the work, but that's okay. That's what I come here for. And that's the chapter 11, the customer satisfaction, understanding the way it works and why it works. Big thing with customer satisfaction that's to be factored in here is because it sits at the core of perceived versus actual that you'll find you're having, uh, it's drawing down on a range of other marketing subject toolkits, not least of which is that it takes a lot of inputs from consumer behavior. Measuring it draws on market research and it outputs into strategy around growth models, um, particularly around selling more product to the existing customer.